Hello everyone. Today, let's continue to discuss about the singular numerical relativity. In our topic today, we will discuss about the application of the mechanics of numbers, gravity, and the square law. I already said in our introduction that uh, to resolve the conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics, we need to complete general relativity. To complete general relativity, we need a description of space-time or a description of the geometry of space-time in just two dimensions. The tool that will allow us to explain this uh, description of space-time in two dimensions will come from Galileo's physical experiment. We learned that the general relativity was built on the foundation of the thought experiments of Einstein. But before Einstein existed Galileo, who already conducted an experiment which was so important to explain the geometry of space-time in two dimensions. Galileo's experiment will give us the tool that uh, we need and that tool is the number. Therefore, we will study the mechanics of numbers. When I say mechanics of numbers, I mean the physics of numbers, because numbers are real. Numbers are physical. Numbers are the fundamental building blocks of space-time. So when we go beyond particles, we find numbers. Numbers vibrate because they have a structure that allows them to do so. Numbers are like this antenna. I already explained before. Number can retract, stretch retract and stretch. Retract and stretch describe the motion of numbers and this motion is what we call vibration. The vibration of a number happens in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions. The operations that allow us to study the vibrations of numbers are acceleration, deceleration, expansion, projection, and explosion. It simply means that a number can accelerate, a number can decelerate, a number can expand, a number can be projected, a number can explode. Through these operations, we will be able to bring out all the data from the numbers. And this will help us to measure events in space and in time. We know that uh, the very fundamental explanation of uh, relativity is that uh, relativity is a field of studies that measures events, where they happen, and when they happen, and even by how much two events are separated in space and in time. We are going to measure space-time. We have 
to identify the events. Identify means to count the events. How many? In quantum physics, we see that when a physical reaction takes place, there are many possibilities in the outcome of the reaction. So we need to know how many possibilities. This is what we call identify events. Secondly, we need to measure or quantify the events, meaning we need to know how much. So if we have 10 events, how much will go here, there, and there? We have to be able to tell exactly the amount that is attributed to every possibility. In the end, we will be able to understand that uh, space-time is quantized. Quantization is the concept that uh, a physical quantity can have only a discrete number of values. You understand that? So for space-time, we are going to cut space-time into portions in order to measure it. And there, we will realize that a bit of space-time can have only two pairs of uh, complementary values or symmetric values. So this is a very important news I am announcing here. Space-time is quantized. And what we are going to use as a ruler to measure the space-time. When I say ruler, I literally mean ruler like this. A ruler. We are going to use a ruler in order to measure space-time. And that ruler is provided by Galileo's experiment. Now, let's start with uh, our main topic today. The numerical mechanics and the square law. You know all about the square law. The square law is the process by which we go dividing or multiplying by square. To understand it, we need to really understand how numbers work. Because numbers are the only guide for us here. Numbers are relative. I already showed you that a number can take different values. For example, we have number four. Number four will vibrate in two dimensions. At first, number four is only one. It has only one value. And this one value also represents one location. When it goes to the first level, it will have three more values. Se second level, five. Third level, seven. Fourth level, nine. And we stop only here. The reason we have to stop here, because when we count number four, we say one, two, three, four. So number four can go only four steps. So if the number was 10 here, then we will go up to 10 steps. And each step here is what we call the level. These are called the levels of variability of a number. So in the process, number takes 
different values. Now, when you compute the number of values for every number, you will find that uh, the number of values will be the number itself plus one square. So we say here that uh, the number of values or number of locations that a number will occupy when projected in two dimensions is directly proportional to the square of the number of levels. The number of levels. Level 0, level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4. So if you sum up all the levels, you have 4 plus 1. So that's why we have 4 plus 1 squared, or n plus 1 squared. So this represents the number of values or of locations where a number will be when it is projected in two dimensions. And that is called the information zone of a number. So for any number, as you see here, we start always initially with one location for the number. When it goes to the next, it becomes 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. So you can continue. You see the order. It goes that way. So you have here 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, etc. So the information zone for any number is n plus 1 squared. Now, our main thing we have to understand here is the square arrow of a number. You see, we go from one location for number 4 to 25 locations. One represents one square. Five uh, or 25 represents five square. To go from one square to five square, we cannot jump because numbers do not accept a leap. There is no leap in numbers. I will show you this, this way. Number four, projected in two dimensions, will occupy 25 locations. This is the same graphic that we have and above we have reproduced here. So we go from one square to five square. How to do it? For numbers, it is a must that you have to pass through two square, three square, and four square in order to reach five square. And in that process, we will be adding only a number of locations or a number of values. As you see here, we start with one. Then the next we will add to the first level, we will add three values, which make four. Two square, four. Next, second level, we will add five locations or five values, which make in all nine or three square. Next, we add seven, making 
four square. Next, nine, making five square. So the value that we add to a square to have the next square is what we call the square arrow of a number. You see very well the shape is a, it's an arrow. Hmm? You can change the position of that as you wish. You can change it this way, that way, but uh, it is it, really described an arrow. This is an arrow. 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 That's what we call it. the square arrow. So on that level, to calculate the square arrow on a given level, you have to get the level number multiplied by 2 plus 1. For example, I take level, this is level 2. So you have to get 2 times 2 plus 1. That's what gives you 5. So this 5 here is the square arrow of 2. The square arrow of 2 is 5. The square arrow of 4 is 9. Now, why we are doing this? Because we have to understand that uh, numbers are very strict. They don't accept a leap, meaning a jump. To go from 1 square to 5 square, you have to pass through all the values between, meaning 2 square, 3 square, 4 square. And because of this, we say that uh, numbers obey the square law. So the mechanics of numbers obey the square law. Now let's see if anything like this in the physics that we have studied already. To begin with, we will go back to Galileo's experiment. Galileo conducted the experiment on the objects in the free fall because he wanted to know how fast objects in the free fall travel. Do they follow a constant speed or the speed changes? So he wanted to verify that, and he found out that uh, the distance an object travels during the free fall is directly proportional to the square of time. It means distance equal time square. This formula is very strange, because in the conventional physics, we know that the distance is not calculated this way. And that's why we are going to study what happens here. Why time square? But anyway, we see very clearly here that uh, during his uh, experiment, Galileo found out that uh, if the object travels once only the unit of distance during the first unit of time, then after two units of time, the object will travel four times the unit of distance. For three units of time, it will travel nine times the unit of distance. Four, 16. Five, 25. This is to say that uh, an object in the free fall obeys the square law. And one more thing we have to understand here is the rate of increase in speed. You see that uh, here we said it's only once 
the object travel, so meaning one time the unit of distance. But if you go up to second unit here, then you will have four times. It means there is an already an increase of three units. But what it means? Here it travels only once. Here it travels three. So the speed, the rate of change in speed is two times the unit of distance. When it goes here, it becomes five. So plus two, plus two, seven, plus two, nine. So the rate of increase in speed, what we call acceleration here, is going by plus two, plus two, plus two. You understand that? Yeah. So now, what does this diagram illustrate? We are talking about the free fall of objects. Objects fall because of a force called gravity. That was the key point of the theory of Newton. Gravity. Then, what Galileo observed, the numbers that we have seen here, are all describing gravity. The motion of the object in the free fall. So, we have to understand that uh, gravity obeys the square law. And gravity is acceleration. Now let's see if there are other phenomena that have been studied already in physics, which explain also the square law. The first example is about light. You go to a movie house, then you watch the image on the screen. According to calculations done by the scientists, it says here that uh, the size of the image on the screen is directly proportional to the square of the distance between the projector and the screen. It means at any place you will be here, you will have a square number. That's why you see here it is one square, two square, three square, four square, five square. So you will have always square numbers. The light obeys the square law because the image you see on the screen is light. Light obeys the square law. It means when light travels through space, it doesn't just travel randomly. As a consequence of this, scientists also studied the intensity of light and they found out that the Intensity of light is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the source of light and the point where you are studying it from. We saw here that uh, as light leaves the source here, begin it, uh, it is uh, the space start getting bigger and bigger. Consequently, the intensity is getting smaller and smaller. Why? Because space is wider and the little quantity of light which is here must fit 
within the area limited or the area dictated by the square law. Light loses power as it travels through distance. We have other phenomena also which obey the square law or the inverse square law. When I say square law or inverse square law is uh, the same thing. The reason I say the same thing, why? Because simply you have to understand that uh, as light travels through space, the distance is increasing, therefore the intensity is decreasing. Space is getting wider and wider, but the power, the intensity, or the energy will decrease. That's uh, very simple to understand. That's, but uh, all of that, it is regulated by the square law. So you will have directly proportional for the space or the area, but inversely proportional for the intensity. So the square law or inverse square law, it is the same thing, only you have to understand when it is inversely proportional or directly proportional. So we have gravity. Here it says point sources of gravitational force. Electric field, electromagnetic field, I add. Light, radiation, sound, all obey the inverse square law. What we are interested in is the question why all of them obey the square law. They do obey the square law because all these phenomena use space-time as the arena. They are performed within space-time. Therefore, they are influenced by gravity. They are influenced by the geometry of space-time. And the geometry of space-time is what we call the square law. The square law. You understand this? This is very clear. Now, based on this understanding, we can re-examine the double slit experiment.